And hey, everybody, I've got an amazing and special guest with me today. It is uh, entrepreneur Bill Anagnos. And Bill, thank you so much for coming on because I've been looking to connect with you and do this podcast episode for a while now because I just love the story of starting your own watch brand. And how are you doing today? Well, Emmett, first of all, thank you for having me on the podcast. And hello, podcast world. My first time doing a podcast, so thank you for being a gracious audience and a gracious host. Uh, I'm doing well. It's, uh, I think COVID has kind of, uh, kind of kicked a few things down and kind of been a little bit of a challenge. Um, but it's been nice because my daughter, who's seven, her name is Anastasia, she said to me, hey, Dad, you know, it's great that you started uh, Delta Watch because it's online because of COVID things being shut down. So that was very sweet of her to say, uh, I'd like to still focus working on developing brand more and marketing more. So it's kind of where we are as far as right now with Delta. I'm in it. Yeah. And it sounds like it was a very smart thing that she said too, you know, to realize like that, that like market economy situation. So um, it seems like she's picking, picking up from her, from her, uh, from you, from her dad. So yeah, you know, what I'm trying to do with my daughter is um, really started to think now, even at age seven, if she would start her own business, what that would look like. So she'll talk about, I want to make cookies or I want to make ice cream. So I start, start asking her about costs and margin and having her thinking about the market and who she's going to market to. Uh, because I want to give her that mindset, not that she's going to go into that, maybe God blesses her with something else, but if she wants to start the business, I want to be able to prime the pump to maybe give her some of the tools uh, so she can have growing up. So anyway. Wow, that's amazing to be able to share that experience that you've taken over your lifetime and be able to uh, pass that knowledge and that wisdom to her. And you know, it sounds like she's picking up some stuff. So that's awesome. All right. So um, real quick, I mean, you were able to share this with me, but you know, you started Delta Watches, but you know, obviously this is a this isn't something you've been doing all your life. So can you share a little bit about how you, I guess, just a, a rundown of how you got into the watch business? Uh, okay. Well, um, starting at around 2000, I uh, got interested in collecting watches. I've always been kind of interested in watches, but never really gone full blown into a hobby aspect of it. Uh, I remember my, probably my first watch, one of the first watches I had, I found it on a uh, junior high, which you guys now call middle school playground. And I turned it into the school and they said, we got to wait a couple weeks to see if somebody claims it. And if they don't claim it, it's yours. So I remember the joy of going back two weeks later to pick up this watch. It was a glow in the dark LCD uh, digital watch. It was really, really cool. And then later on in life, though, around the year 2000, I started getting more into the hobby. Uh, I started primarily uh, with a specific brand called Invicta, which is a lot more popular now. It's more of a, a TV brand now, uh, but it was a very popular kind of a starter watch. And it was Invicta 8926 was the model. And it kind of looks like a, a little bit of a Rolex. Uh, so that kind of got me primed into the pump. And then at the same time, during that time, I was working for my uh, father in a family business in electronics. Uh, in purchasing. So most of my experience was dealing with uh, China, Japan, Germany, Italy. So when it came time to start a business, and you and I both went to the same Jack Welch Management Institute, we got a little, little plug there for Jack Welch, uh, which was a great experience, and that's where you and I met. Uh, I wanted to somehow find a way to create a business that had some passion in it, and some story to it, and some history, and so I wanted to leverage my watch hobby with the mixture of my education, with the mixture of my background in purchasing supply chain, and to somehow come up with a business. And so that's kind of how Delta Watch started. And it's been actually in the works for quite some time uh, due to the fact that it really is, takes a lot of time to develop a product and to source a product and to create those relationships with vendors. So It'd be nice to say it was as easy as just finding a product online and slapping your name on it, but it isn't. Uh, so anyway, I'll pause and let you kind of. Oh, yeah. yeah. Right on. And what I really thought was so powerful about that, uh, that we can, that anybody can take away is this whole idea of, you know, you leveraging these skills and experiences that you already had 
and, you know, based and, and combine them with your passion as opposed to, you know, just saying, well, I don't know what I'm going to do. Uh, you know, should I do this or should I do that? And I don't know if you went through that period, but it sounds like you at least, you know, we're like, okay, so I've got some interest here and I've got a uh, strengths here. So let me, you know, combine those. So uh, I'd like to ask you, I mean, was it something that was like, um, like a, a struggle to make that decision or was it, you know, you were like, wow, I need to do this. I'm doing this. And yeah, I think everyone from an entrepreneurial standpoint, I think everyone just comes from a different starting point. You know, just like uh, when runners run some, some people, they put them at a different position based on the relay and where they're starting at and the, in the relay race. I, I think for me, um, I needed to kind of really sort through a lot of things before I made that decision. So one of the things I did in our JWMI MBA program is for every single class where it was germane and where the professors would allow, I would answer all of my questions uh, weekly. We had weekly discussion questions. I would answer all of my questions as if Delta was up and running and it was real and alive. And then I wrote my papers, regardless of the, the topic or the theme or the class, as if it was a Delta-related quest paper and topic. So that kind of gave me a framework and maybe the confidence to kind of feel my way through before I actually even launched. Even though when I was in school, I was already in the process of developing uh, my first model and I had some setbacks and then I had to uh, pitch that model and go with a different vendor. So there's been some setbacks, but what I did was I said, okay, let me use my classroom as the proving ground or the testing ground um, to kind of see where my weak spots are, my blind spots are, to kind of help me to, when I decide to launch this thing, to make it as most successful as possible um, or minimize any of the potential problems. And I, I like one of the professors, basically, he challenged me on this. He says, well, how do you know you're just not really crazy uh, on the front end? How do you know that, you know, you're doing the right thing? And so that was really nice that he challenged me that way to help me think through some of the things. So I think for me, I needed that. I needed that educational component. Some people may not. It may come, education may come through a podcast. It may come through a book. It may come through an inspiration of a friend. But for me, I think the, the educational aspect and then kind of using it as a training ground and a proving ground helped me to, to get ready to have the confidence to launch. Hey, that's great. So, uh, so you were able to you know, use that time. And so did you specifically go into the MBA program knowing that you were going to develop Delta watches and you wanted to use that time or was it just like, good question? No, actually, no, I just, I, I felt for me at the time, uh, I felt like I needed to, to kind of gain a new, a new skill set. Um, I wanted to be able to learn new skill set, create new opportunities for myself, uh, obviously invest in oneself, invest in myself. So no, I don't think I had it for sure, 100% that Delta was going to go live. Um, it was probably, though, in the first, second, or third class that I said, okay, let me start going down this road. But that was not my original intention. And, of course, hey, I'm open to anything, even now, just like we mentioned uh, before the podcast, we were, I mean, and I were mentioning that, you know, it's good sometimes to have your hands in a lot of different pies because, uh, you know, you don't know, Scripture says, cast your bread upon many waters because you don't know where your harvest is coming in from. And so, Sometimes you don't know what's going to strike gold or strike fire. So it's okay to keep knocking and trying different things. Um, but for me, I just, that's kind of how I, I kind of where we are today with Delta. Yeah, that's fantastic. And uh, so you meant, you mentioned uh, trying different things. So circling back earlier, you mentioned like different setbacks and everything. And with every, you know, entrepreneur, there's challenges and things like that. Can you share a little bit, you know, maybe not so, it doesn't necessarily have to be like about the actual setback itself, but like, how did you overcome, you know, how did you not just like be like, oh, this is it? Was it a huge setback? You know, how did you overcome that? What was some of the thoughts? That yeah, I think, I think if, and again, it depends on the people you talk to, because I've heard people talk to, that I've talked to people that um, have started their own business and they're like, oh, I've never had a fear in the world. And to me, I'm like, okay, that's cool. That's them. That's not me. I, I have my own issues to overcome. And I think we all have them, if we're honest, whatever that might be. Um, I, think, I think it's just getting up and just doing the next thing, right? Uh, for the first vendor, I, I had tooled up a watch, paid the money, I designed it. Uh, and then there were some problems with the quality. And I want to, you know, I'm going to slap my name on something. I want it to be a good, great product. And I want people to enjoy it. And again, remember, I, I come from the hobbyist, hobbyist background. So 
you know, having having almost 20 some years as a hobbyist, I kind of know what something should look like and feel like uh, and what the price point should be. So when this factory sent me the sample and things weren't just right, I kind of had a call them on it. Uh, unfortunately, instead of saying, hey, we're going to we're going to fix it. They started blaming me. They said I broke them. I said, what do you mean I broke them? I gave them all this money to tool it. And then I decided to break it for what, it, for what purpose. It was illogical. Um, so, so for me, that was kind of one of the stumbling blocks and one of the setbacks. And, it, and then at that point, you say, to okay, do you continue moving forward or do you find somebody else or do you do something else? So I think, I think every day in an entrepreneurial life or a business owner's life, there's always going to be these challenges. Uh, and I think all life is like that, really. If we're honest, there's always some kind of setback. It's how do we roll with the punches? How do we, how do we deal with those things? Um, it's, it's, it's easier to just put your head in the sand and say, I give up. Uh, and I think if most people are honest, you want to give up at some time. It's like, okay, fine. You know, they're not interested or they're not going to help me, you know, but, um, I think also I've invested a lot of time and energy into it. So for me, it's kind of, I don't want to go back. And, uh, and I think that there's, I can find a way to leverage my experience and my education and my, uh, my hobby into something that would be profitable. And also, of course, ultimately to be a blessing to folks to, have a lot that they would enjoy for sure and and one question that i had i guess just like as you're talking about your brand and everything in delta in terms of did, did you were you when you were developing that brand was it really difficult to come up with a name like how did you decide like this is going to be what you know i'm putting my name behind this is going to be delta mm -hmm. or whatever yeah, Emmett, good question, and I and and I appreciate the, again the interview. I appreciate the questions. Uh, so for me, I'm I'm Greek American, generation one. My my folks are both from Greece, uh, so I wanted to kind of do something, tap into my Hellenic Greek background. So Delta to me kind of had a double entendre. It has a military feel to it, and then Alta Delta in science is means change, and of course Delta is one of the letters in the Greek alphabet. So I think just all of those combined, and then it's a short name because you don't want Bill's Watches of America. It's too long of a name. So Delta was short and sweet, and it just meant a lot to me. So again, there was a story behind it because I know story connects with people, connects with me. So that was the rationale behind the name Delta. Fantastic. And thank you for sharing that story. I'm glad I was able to capture that. It's fantastic. All right. And in terms of building the business, a lot of the things that I, and we just, I just happen to be familiar with the things that you learned in JWMI, but you know, there was the, clearly the strategic elements of it, right? Like sourcing and operations that you went over and probably, you know, a lot of the financial stuff probably helped you in building your business. And on the leadership side, you know, I, I know you have a lot of experience in like leadership and public speaking and all that. Um, can you, can you talk a little bit about like, you know, maybe that like vision element and how to like craft, like how do you get motivated from, from just being a, like an employee for, per se, which, you know, there's nothing wrong with that, but how do you like transform from, you know, just doing the job to, you know, actually having to craft that vision and, you know, be a leader who's going to be building a business or is building a business in the watch industry? Uh, that's another good question. Well, again, I think everyone comes to that for a different, uh, a different time, a different starting point, a different uh, point in their life. I think for me, it was the realization that I've got to be my own person, whatever that means for each person. And for me, it meant I have to be free to make my own decisions and create my own destiny, uh, or at least, at the very least, give give Delta a try and let's see if this thing can take off and let's see what I can do with it. Um, and I feel like I've come to this kind of starting point later in life than most people because I have uh, worked in, in, in corporations, I've done uh, contract positions, I've been in a lot of different companies and I keep coming to the conclusion that I just feel like I don't fit their mold of, of the corporate yes man. I want to be able to say, hey, this is wrong and let's fix it instead of always worrying about towing the party line. And so many people I know are in scenarios where uh, they've got to tow the party line and they've got to be this person that they're not. And it's a very stressful place to be. And it's a very uh, unhealthy place, I think, to be long term. 
What so for me, it was, start? yeah. Uh, what do you mean by toe the party line? I'm not familiar with that. Well, so what I mean is that, so a lot of, you know, every organization has its own culture, right? And sometimes you get into an organization and you realize pretty quickly, you're not a good fit for their, for their, for their culture or their culture is one that you've got to kind of just do it their own way. Uh, and if you don't do it their way, then, you know, you're never going to move up or there's the door. And, you know, Jack Welch, he, you know, he said, if you didn't like a culture, uh, you had to make a decision. Either you're going to grin and bear it, or you've got to start planning your way out. And I just feel like I've been in enough scenarios where I kind of came to the conclusion that, you know what, I've got to be me, and that doesn't fit in a certain mold, in a certain pattern uh, uh, of corporate America. Not that corporate America is bad. I mean, there's a lot of great things and a lot of great companies I've been in and a lot of great people that I've met. But as far as this, this whole constant thing that's over your head, oh, well, you can't do this in this culture. You can't say that. I mean, for me, and I think it was also the other fact is when, when I started working for my father, probably around age 15, I saw the start of a business from its infancy all the way to its development, all the way to its sale later on. And to me, I learned a lot of skills where in, in a small business, you have to wear a lot of hats. And to me, when I went from that environment to the corporate environment, I just saw a lot of silos and a lot of just stuff that's just silly and a waste of time and inefficiency. And it kind of drives me nuts. So for me, again, I think I came to this place of entrepreneurship from a, from a, at a different time later in life and maybe from a different starting point and maybe for a different reason than a lot of people did. I just came to the conclusion it's not who I am. doesn't mean I won't. You know, maybe put my hand in that I do at some point. I don't know with COVID what the, what's going to happen, you know. Uh, but I just know that's where I am today, and that's kind of how I got to this place, um, if that helps. Yeah, that is very helpful. And, okay, so, you know, you've been in, in it for a while, like uh, learning about business and everything. And, I, you know, just looking back, you mentioned 15, getting into the business with your dad. And, you know, say someone doesn't have, like, that, that experience you know maybe they want to become an entrepreneur you know ha later and they didn't really have like the mentors when they were 15 so say they're like you know 30 or 40 and they're like you know i want to i want to be an entrepreneur what can they start to look for like what were some things that you looked for at 15 or that you started to notice that you believe have helped you up to this point to get started on that journey like is there some things you paid attention to in the business or did you, you know, just ha have moments where you sat down and you're like, Hey, how, do, what, what are you doing in this business? Is that, yeah, you know, yeah, again, I, I think for everyone, it's later for, for me, I definitely came in much later life. Uh, I never sat down when I worked with, with my dad or in other places, I never sat down and thought about business and analyzed it because I didn't have that tool set in my box. Uh, so it wasn't, until I went through the MBA program and as I was going through it, where all of a sudden you started to see all these little pieces come together. We started seeing the interrelationship of things. And you started to see, okay, that's now why we did that, or that's why that organization did that, or that's why this the small business uh, that my dad started, why he did that, why he didn't do that. And the pieces started to, to make sense. They started to fall into place. So for me, it came in much later in life. And I don't know, I, I, I heard an interview recently, and I'm not going to tell you who it was, but basically this, this guru said to somebody who was in their 40s, no, you shouldn't go and start this because you're just too old and it hasn't happened. And I thought, no, I kind of lean towards the Gary Vee point of view, which is, you know what, hey, start whenever you want to start. You know, um, I don't know how old Colonel Sanders was. He was probably in his 50s and 60s. Uh, you know, Mr. Walmart was, was late, much later in life, too. So you know what? I say go for it. I say don't let what anybody else says stop you from trying something. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. I think, I think just the fact that you tried it to me is a successful thing. You know, if you can sell a bucket of chicken, I mean, I don't think Mr. Colonel Sanders thought from his little chop that he was going to go worldwide and be popular. And Sam Walton, I don't know. Now, there are some of these entrepreneurs who, who you will you know, interview and they will say, no, I knew this was going to be a success and I could see it. Okay. Some people can, some people cannot. But I say try for it. I say go for it, uh, regardless of what age you're at. And you're going to learn along the way. The question also, though, is also what is your what is your appetite for risk? How long are you willing to pursue it? Uh, can you financially pursue it? Can you emotionally pursue it? 
Um, so those are some questions you're going to have to ask yourself too. But I say go for it. You just never know. You just never know. Why not ask? Um, why not try? So that, that would be yeah. my, my word to somebody. That's, that's great. And I, when you think of the watch industry or when I think of the watch industry, you know, I, I, it's, it's fascinating for anyone to even start in there because there are so many brands out there and, you know, to, and I've seen your watches, they look fantastic. You know, they're, they're so cool. You mentioned the, the combination between like the military and it's got the, uh, the, the divers designs. I'm not sure the exact terms, but you know, it's very, um, not athletic, but like, uh, like survival gear, tactical in a way. I don't know if that's yeah. Define it, but yeah, I, like like basically getting a uh, and I don't know, like a souped up version of a whatever car model you want, the top of the line or something, or or getting an off road vehicle that will never take off road. That's what the divers' watches tend to be. You know, they're they're over engineered, but it's this idea of but if I need to, I can you know tackle this mountain. If I need to, I can go with the Delta Hydra or two thousand meters underwater. You know that kind. Of yeah. And okay. So this, this brings up another point um, or another question is this concept of, you know, you, you have the supply chain experience, you spend a lot of time in your MBA, like planning everything. And, and, you know, you mentioned this idea of, you know, some people they're able to see the, see the vision. They're like, this is it. And, and others have a more difficult time getting there. So was there like a, a moment when, and, 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 thinking of all the different roles that you had, right? As the CEO, you got to do the marketing, you got to do the supply chain or whatever. How did, what inspired like the design? Did it just like appear? Were you sitting down drawing like designs like that? Yeah, I think, I think like, yeah. Yeah, ahead. you know, that's a good question. I think, you know, currently what's really popular in the, in the watch world uh, is, is kind of a retro vintage look. And I wanted to do something that was a little different, but not, because here's the, here's the challenge as, as any product developer, the challenge is, okay, you want to be fresh and you want to be you, but if you're so different, no one's going to buy it and you're stuck with inventory, right? So that becomes, you know, inventory is a liability until you sell it. So what do you do? And if you're so exactly the same, people are going to scream, you're a copy, you're a copy. So where do you find where do you find your identity? Where do you find the balance? And that's a very difficult line uh, to, to to find a balance in. So for me, though, I wanted to kind of go with the trend and to be a little more on the vintage side and to and to kind of design around that. I, I, my watch uh, for those in the watch world and the, in the micro brand world and the hobbyists will clearly see that my watch has inspiration from Omega, specifically from the Omega Plo Prof model that came out in the seventies. Uh, so that's kind of my inspiration. That's the current trend is it more of a retro uh, themed styled uh, watches. Yeah. And I, I like that you shared where you got your inspiration from. So thank you for that. I, I think it's great because, you know, I, I start to see a lot of watch brands and I see, you know, some like similarities that are taken and, you know, the different designs and everything, but like, every brand ends up adding like their own little piece, you know, their own little touch to make it even more special. So, you know, I've seen your watches, they're pretty different and I'm not sure exactly what the technology is, but it does have like this little piece on the side. Oh yeah. yeah. So it's called the helium escape valve. Um, on the original Omega Pro Prof, that little um, thing at the two o'clock is actually a button and it locks this, what's called a, bez a rotating bezel. It locks this. So the idea was that if you were a diver underwater and you were using this to measure time, you could lock it so you, you wouldn't accidentally hit it. On my watch, it's what's called the helium escape valve, and it was something that uh, Rolex invented back in the 50s. And the idea was when deep sea divers were going down and doing welding, they were using a mixture of oxygen and helium. And as they were ascending, what would happen is the helium particles would get into the watch and explode it and destroy it. So they had to figure out a way, because helium was lighter than oxygen, they had to figure out a way how to get rid of it. And so they created something called the helium escape valve. And a lot of divers' watches have it. Now, again, are you going to use it? I don't know. It's nice to have. And again, it's that whole idea of ruggedness. You know? yeah, you're know, you going to take a Mercedes uh, AMG uh, SUV wagon you know, at a 33-degree incline? I don't know. But if you want to, you could. So it's, it's just it's that idea, of, you know, uh, as you mentioned earlier, you know, uh, sportiness, ruggedness, uh, boldness, you know, kind of 
a guyish kind of a thing. Uh, but I've also had, you know, ladies that have been interested. I have a lady customer who bought it. So it's not a watch stick. It has to be exclusively uh, for for men only. That's awesome, Bill. And uh, thank you for sharing so much about how you are, are developing and growing your company. So for, for the supply chain area, you know, did you, and, and this is a popular you know, topic that I'm hearing a lot about nowadays is the concept of like outsourcing. And recently, you know, just as you, you made me think of an example of uh, this company, Fisker, it's a car company. Have you heard it? Are you familiar with them? Mm -hmm. And how, you know, Fisker is using another manufacturer to manufacture the cars while he does the designs and everything. So in terms of like outsourcing, I mean, it's tough for a CEO to do everything. So have you had an opportunity to, you know, do you do literally everything yourself or you, know, you did mention the manufacturing, but like what areas? Yeah, so I, yeah, so I use a subcontractor. Uh, we're using a subcontractor model. I don't obviously to own your own factory uh, and to be vertically integrated, as we would say in the business world, is very expensive. And it's a very expensive uh, outlay on the front end. Uh, a lot of micro brands, as mine is considered a micro brand, will start off sourcing or will have a subcontractor relationship. Uh, and then they will at some point get uh, vertically integrated because they feel like they can control costs better, uh, quality better. But it's also a very large investment financial on the front end. Uh, so it's a very large risk. So again, you have to measure your, your risk appetite. Um, but for me, I'm currently using the subcontract business model. Uh, it's what I'm familiar with. Uh, it may not be necessarily the easier way to do it because you do have to then obviously develop relationships. Uh, inspect your own quality, uh, so forth and so on. So um, that's where we are as far as that part. And then the rest of it, all the rest of it, I'm, I'm doing all the rest of it. Um, I'm trying to work on the marketing, the sales, the Facebook ads, uh, finding good website people, finding, uh, you know, all kinds of things just to get, you know, get Delta up and running and working. Beautiful. And, you know, I, I really love following your story on LinkedIn and, and seeing your updates. And I, I was talking to somebody earlier about that, like, journey of sharing your story. And you mentioned Gary Vaynerchuk. So such great timing because, you know, he's constantly talking about documenting and you know, your story and all of that. So it's great to witness a entrepreneur who's building a watch brand, uh, you know, do that and apply it and be able to hear about those successes so, you know, thank you so much for jumping on this podcast with me and being able to share even how you're doing, but also not just the how, which is only partly helpful, but like what inspired you and how you were able to find, you know, that those resources to be able to do what you're doing. So thanks so much. And all of the information is going to be in a description uh, to reach out to Bill Ignagnos. Um, but Bill, just like uh, just to get a quick rundown, I mean, what are the best ways that you would like for people to contact you? Yeah, so there's a couple ways because we live in a multi-connected world. Uh, if you go to uh, Facebook, and most people are on Facebook, we do have a Delta Watch group, and you can reach out to me there, and I do respond either through comments or private messages for that. Also, um, you can go to our website, which is deltawatch.co, and you can send a message there, or you can email me directly at info at deltawatch.co. That's info at deltawatch.co. And I'd be more than happy to answer any questions anybody has. And it doesn't have to be watch related. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, so that's, that's where we're at there at Delta. Amazing. Well, uh, love the entrepreneurial journey. That, and I was, I'm so glad that I've been able to... Uh, learn from it and be able to have it on this episode. So thank you, Bill. And thank you and have a wonderful day, everybody. Thank you so much. Take care.